Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. From now until we finish Revelation, by the way, I am going to go through um, the New Testament in its canonical order, that is, in the way that we have it in our scriptures. I'm not going to try to put them in order by, by date. We're talking about everything written within uh, 40 years of it anyway, and so there's no reason to try to put it like we would with the Old Testament. It's all right there one time, and so uh, we're just going to go straight through. Uh, but, but from now on, we'll read Scripture every time. Uh, th this will be a little different than the Old Testament survey that we did, and that is because we're going to have to introduce different theological concepts as we go. Now, still, it's not a theology course. It's a, it's a New Testament survey to show you what's in there. But as, as we discuss it, there, there has to be theological considerations that come out. We did that some in the Old Testament, but they'll be much more um, apparent in the New Testament when I, because, because I may say some things that you've not heard before or vice versa, or I may, I may not say some things that you want me to say. And so all of that, uh, all of that deals with the, the, the approach that we have to the New Testament. And I'll address some of those as we get there. Just like everything else, at any time, feel free to ask questions. Uh, I, am, I have intentionally made today a bite-sized approach, so there's plenty of time to ask questions. Uh, but this is the introduction to the book of Matthew. So, starting in verse number one of chapter one. The record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, from the very beginning, from, from that very first, it's not even a complete sentence, it's just the introduction, from that very first thing, we are introduced to the key person in the New Testament, in fact, the key person in the whole of the Bible, but we see um, immediately who, who Matthew is introducing us to, and that is Jesus uh, by the way, you should call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All right. Jesus, Yeshua, is the name for Joshua. Uh, so like old time Joshua, uh, Jesus is named after him. That, that word just means uh, the Lord saves or Savior, so the, the, uh, that's the idea. And so Jesus, the Lord saves, here we have him. You shall call his name Jesus, uh, for he shall save his people from the sins. But not just Jesus, because there was a lot of Jesuses around then. Jesus was just another name like Joshua or John or, you know, Mary or Elizabeth. Uh, it's just not just, I mean, we all, all our names are, your name is special. Your name is special. But I mean, it's just normal name. Like, um, uh, I, it, it troubled me as a kid because I grew up in this super strict household. It troubled me as a kid to be looking at my baseball cards and find an outfielder whose name was Jesus, right? Of course, he pronounced it Jesus, but it's the same name, all right? It's the same name. Jesus is Jesus' name. But I want you to understand that Jesus is just a normal name because Jesus was just a normal guy in some ways. He, he was just like us, except not just like us, <laughs> but he was, but he wasn't. So anyway, um, more about Jesus later. But notice that, so Jesus, but not just Jesus, Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. Uh, that, by the way, Messiah and Christ are the same words, different language. Messiah comes from the Hebrew, uh, uh, Christ comes from the Greek. It simply means the anointed one. So in this case, though, it doesn't mean simply the anointed one. This is Jesus, who is the promised anointed one, the one and only anointed one. So Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, what, what does he get if he's the son of David? What does that speak to? The throne, the promised throne, that the, that the throne of David would never depart from the house of David. So the son of David the son of Abraham. What about that? The 
that all the promises that God had made in Abraham are fulfilled in Jesus. So uh, let me, let me, this is a little theology. I'm going to put it back into it and then we're going to keep trucking. I just want you to see this. This comes out first. This is Matthew saying it. And by the way, Matthew says this differently than anybody else does. And, and I'll show you that in a second. So we have this so we have Matthew saying these things, and these things are what's important to Matthew, that Jesus, the son of Mary and Joseph, is also the promised one of God, the Messiah. He's also the one who, who will be the king, son of David, and in him all the promises of Abraham, which are the land, the legacy, the lineage, all those things are wrapped up in Jesus. Ultimately, we're going to hear Paul argue this clearly, but it comes, it's, it's rooted right here in Matthew's gospel, that those who are in Christ are also the recipients of the promises of Abraham. They belong to the kingdom of God, and they will be saved by Jesus the Messiah. All right, so that's the, from the very beginning, the foundation of all this that's what's in Matthew's mind as he's writing this gospel. All right, so let's just look at this together. The basics of Matthew. What in the world? There it is. Backwards. All right, so katamathion is the name of this in Greek. It just means according to, kata, according to, and that's Matthew's name in Greek, Matthion, uh, according to Matthew. That's the title of this. Um, in my copy of the scriptures, it says the gospel according to Matthew. Uh, yours may say that too. In the Greek, it just, it doesn't say the gospel according to Matthew. It just says kata Matthion, according to Matthew. That's the, that's the name of this. Um, who is the author? <laughs> You would think that was a trick question, wouldn't you? You would think it'd be the same, like, who's, who's buried in Grant's tomb, right? So Grant is buried in Grant's tomb. Uh, who's buried, you know, who wrote Matthew? Well, Matthew did. Uh, and so the earliest manuscripts, the earliest manuscripts we have say that it's according to Matthew. In fact, there's not a manuscript that we have of the, this book that doesn't say according to Matthew. It's from the earliest manuscripts. Uh, the church fathers, so starting about 100 A.D., so we're talking about 65, 70 years after Jesus rose and went to sit, be seated at the right hand of the Father, the, those church fathers, the, the, the next generation and then onward, the next generation after Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, uh, all those folks, the next generation, they're already attributing this book to Matthew and from church tradition. About 140 AD, so 100, 140 years after, uh, 145 years after Jesus' birth, there's no church that's known that doesn't view this manuscript as from Matthew. All right, so so we're talking about the earliest manuscripts, the earliest church theologians after the apostles, and the unanimous agreement of every church that's around that we have record of, all of them attest to this book being from Matthew, the, the disciple of Jesus, uh, who's also known as Levi the tax collector. All right, so th that's it. Now, modern scholars, the last 150 years, 200 years, they're like, it's anybody but Matthew. <laughs> I, mean, they, I mean, it's, in, they, and, and so what, it, it, what happens is, is that these, these skeptical scholars, starting in about 1700s, 1800s, 1900s to today, um, by the way, one of the, one of the foremost skeptical scholars of Christianity resides in our own state, and he actually, up until recently, was the New Testament uh, professor at um, UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, his name is Bart Ehrman. That's right. 
That's right. The, one of the biggest heretics in, in North America is from, he's a Tar Heel. Don't tell Myra I said that, by the way. Um, but Bart Ehrman, and I mean, these guys exist. Uh, several weeks ago, I preached a sermon from Proverbs that says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Well, that's what, that's what these skeptics and scholars have done is they've, they've tried to be wise in their own eyes. And so what they've, what, the, the premise is, for the, from their perspective, you can't trust anything that the church put out. So if, if the church tradition or if the early church or early scholars said something, you can't trust it. You have to verify it from somewhere else. Well, who else is going to be talking about it? Nobody. Until, I mean, so anyway, that's the, that's the issue so they would say it was written nearly 100 years after it was really written. So somebody else wrote it and put Matthew's name on it. Now, let me just ask you this question. If you were going to write a gospel and you wanted it to be proven true, and so you're going to add a disciple's name to it, which disciple would you use? Would you choose Matthew? Matthew. Okay, so let's say John already has one. Who else would you use? Peter. Peter. Mark was not one. I'm talking about a disciple, one of the 12. You would, put, you would put Peter's name to it or James's, right? Why would you use James, John, or Peter? They were the inner circle, and they went everywhere with Jesus. They were the closest ones to him in the garden. They were in the, little, the room when Jairus' daughter was raised. They were on the Mount of Transfiguration. These three. And so if, if, if Jim Collier was going to develop out of whole cloth a, a religion, and I needed four gospel witnesses, I guarantee you that three of them are going to be Peter, James, and John. But that's not what we have. And so I'm just showing you that... that, that it would be, it's almost fantastical to think that somebody would choose Matthew out of the, because nothing's written about Matthew in there except that he was a tax collector and Jesus ate at his house one time. That's all that we have from, about Matthew throughout, throughout the Bible, throughout the Gospels. And yet here we have Matthew. So I just show you, I want you to understand that there, if, if you go out and read it, it it shocked me and broke my heart big time. I was going through our church, our, our church educational wing, and I ran across um, the great a, a great lecture series. Y'all know what great lecture series are? The like if you they sell them in the back of these travel magazines and stuff. The the great lectures, and you may get them on your on your uh, uh, Facebook feed. They're like, hey, join this, and you can get the great lectures from the world or whatever. And it's a way to get listen to these great people. Anyway. Long story short, I found a, a series of tapes here by Bart Ehrman, the guy I just told you about. Bart is, he's older than me, but he's, he's not dead. So, so, um, so Bart, uh, I found them here. So you know what I did? I walked through the library with them. And then I walked straight to the dumpster and threw them away. <laughs> uh, so I don't know what that, I don't know whose they were. If I owe you some money, I'm sorry. But uh, I just, I, I threw them away. They're, but I say that to say that well-meaning Christians will go into a library. I'm sure you can find his books in our public library. Um, or we'll go into somewhere. We'll go under the religion section because that's where they'll be. And we'll take this junk and read it and think that they've been wrong all along. Because after all, the person who taught them was probably a vacation Bible school teacher or a Sunday school teacher and didn't have any letters after their name. And here this guy is who teaches at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and he's got all kinds of letters after his name. We'll listen to him. And friends, I just want you to know that those letters after their, your name don't prove anything that there have been sweet little old ladies who serve in vacation Bible school teaching kids since the day that Jesus ascended to heaven. You understand that. And it's the old, old story. It hasn't changed. So. I think he may have resigned. I don't know if he retired, but yeah, yeah. So don't trust anything that colleges are putting out. Even, even if they have seminaries. I, 
uh, since I picked on one school, I'll just pick on another from North Carolina. Don't trust anything that comes out of Duke Divinity School. Not one thing. I, it, I'm just telling you. It's the, it, are you all aware of what's going on in the Methodist churches? All right. That is coming from schools like Duke Divinity. Duke was a, eventually, or was primarily a Methodist school. It's long since left that, just like Wake Forest was primarily a Baptist school, and it's long since left that. So you just, and, and I, I know I'm picking on North Carolina schools, that's because you know those. Don't trust anything from anywhere, except if it comes from scriptural. You need to read what they say about the scriptures. If they say the scriptures are true, then listen to them. If they start hemming and hawing and tap dancing, don't listen. Don't listen. They're not, they're not going to lead you right. So, title and author. There it is. Provenance and setting. Provenance just means where it came from. Where it came from. Provenance and setting. Where was it written? We don't know ex exactly. It was written either in Palestine, that is, in, in the area of, of Israel, J Jerusalem, or in Palestine. could have been written in Syria. There are some people who say it may have come um, uh, from Antioch. And by the way, we, we know that Matthew wrote it. It's just where Matthew was and that community of believers who were around him that he was writing to. Um, could be Tyre and Sidon, which is just up to the north and west on the coast of the Mediterranean there. Uh, we don't really know where it was written, where it came from. Um, a, a better question is, what was the original makeup of the community? Who was he writing to? Who were the recipients that were going to listen to this? Well, it was certainly written for a community with Jewish Christian consens consistency. Um, Matthew, and I'll show it to you in a moment, Matthew is more concerned about the Jewishness, the Jewish roots of Christ, than are the other writers. Um, and, it's, and it's probably because he's writing to a group of converts. It, there's no doubt the very first converts to Christianity were Jews. Uh, all of the disciples, all of those original disciples, even Paul, who was going to be the, the disciple or the apostle to the Gentiles, were, they were Jews. They, they were steeped in, in the Old Testament scriptures. And so, uh, so they came. So certainly it was written for a community with Jewish Christian com, uh, consistency. A couple of questions that go with this was, how did they relate to the non-Christian Jewish community? So early on in, in the, let, me, let me call them followers of Christ, because I, I'm going to answer a lot of this in a second, but I, you need to hear this. Um, now, early on, the followers of Christ continued going to the temple. You read that in the book of Acts. They went to the temple, as was their the normal thing. But they also met apart in homes. So they went to the temple early, and then they met, uh, the Christians met. So in the temple, they were mixed with, with, the, uh, with Jews who, who were not, not believers. And so there was this mixture but over time, as the Jews who weren't following Christ continued to um, afflict or persecute those who did follow Christ, eventually there was a complete split away. Um, there are some people who put that date at the complete split about 85 A.D. That's neither here nor there. Nobody really knows if it was 85 A.D. or not. I imagine that it, it took place earlier, uh, maybe even as early, or maybe even when the temple was burned in 70 A.D., maybe even earlier than that. They just weren't welcome. I mean, all you have to do is read Paul's, uh, Paul's journeys through the book of Acts and know that he went, the first place he went was to a synagogue every time. That was his, that was his habit. And you know, he got kicked out of more synagogues than, you know, I, whatever, or whatever the analogy is. I mean, he's, he, that was his normal thing. He'd go, he'd go, he'd start having fruit, and they'd kick him out. And so he'd go next door, and he'd start his own, he'd start his own church. So uh, these questions are, are significant for us. This original community that Matthew wrote to, how did they relate to those non-Christian Jews? Were they together? And what was its aim regarding Jews and Gentiles? Uh, did Matthew write in such a way that he would um, that he, that he would see Gentiles brought in, 
uh, and made, made complete. So these are things we're going we're gonna to answer as we go through the book of Matthew. Um, but uh, the reason why is because Matthew's gospel is clearly interacting with the Jew- Jewishness of some of its people. Uh, the idea that he said the son of Abraham in that verse 1 is significant. Um, he goes all the way back there uh, in, in the genealogy. You know, Mark doesn't even include a genealogy um, because Mark's gospel is written primarily for the Roman hearer, and they don't care about the genealogy. It, doesn't, it didn't matter to him, to, to them. Uh, uh, so what Vicki asked was, is the reason why Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, because it starts with a genealogy? The, the answer is no. Um, it, it's the first book because early on, uh, the first couple of hundred years, it became the, the teaching guide for the, the early church. Matthew is head and shoulders above the other Gospels when it comes to teaching, and I'll answer that in just a moment. We're going there. But uh, Luke has a genealogy as well, but Luke's genealogy is a little different, um, and it, it has a different emphasis, the way it's written. It's not different like different people. It's different by the way it emphasizes the folks. By the way, just as an aside, and this is, this is why this last question matters, is because Matthew includes some interesting people in Jesus' genealogy. A bunch of women, that's right. They weren't just women, though. They were what? They were Gentile women. They were Gentile women. That's what's so significant. That's why this question matters, because it doesn't appear, and obviously we would say it is not because of what we have the rest of the gospel uh, or the rest of the New Testament, but it doesn't appear that Matthew is trying to hide the inclusion of Gentiles into the gospel, because he, from the very beginning, he shows that there were Gentiles always being included. You'll remember that I said in the Old Testament survey that, uh, that God's plan was always for the nations. This is where I get that from, because Matthew, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, sets out to prove that that's always been what's happening by, by including Rahab and, and uh, Ruth and Bathsheba and, and uh, Tamar, all four of those out, from outside of the covenant people. And so, um, anyway, that, you're, you're going to think that you've heard all this before, because you have. I've been including all, I've been preparing you for the book of Matthew and the rest of the New Testament all through the Old Testament. Uh, that, that's just, it's because I don't view it segmented. I view it all as one story. In fact, what you're going to hear me say in just a moment is that Matthew saw Jesus as the rightful fulfillment of all of the promises of the Old Testament. In fact, to read the Old Testament right, you have to see Jesus as the fulfillment of it. You can't just have, that's why you'll never hear me talk about the Hebrew scriptures as if they're different. The Old Testament are Christian scriptures, even though they didn't use the word Christian then. They are Christian scriptures because they have been fulfilled in Christ. Guess who tells us that they've been fulfilled in Christ? Matthew does. Matthew does. Jesus does. It's Jesus' words, but it's Matthew who records that for us, and it's not recorded anywhere else. Uh, I, I didn't come so that the law would be done away with, but so that through me the law might be fulfilled. In fact, not one jot or tittle will pass away. That's th- these are Jesus' words in Matthew, in Matthew's gospel. So, I'm getting way ahead of myself. Let's go. So, the date of writing for Matthew. So, the, there's a general timeline for modern scholarship. All right, so if you were to go to any university in any state in North America, 
not a Christian university, but just a normal university, and you were to take a religion course on the New Testament, it would say this. It, it would play out this scheme. Matthew, and by the way, not just Matthew, but Luke and John as well, were written after Mark, which means it was dependent upon Mark. You say, why? Somebody asked me why. Why? why? Thank you for asking that. Because Mark is the most succinct gospel. It's the shortest. It's the, it's the slimmest, if you'll allow me to use that. Uh, the, the shortest chapters, the shortest number of words. It, it, it's just economy of, of writing. It's very slim. And so, um, modern scholarship believes that that would have been the first one written down. And then what modern scholarship believes is that Matthew would have taken this gospel according to Mark. By the way, they don't believe it was actually Matthew, some other rascal, took this, this book of Mark and then added stuff based on what he wanted you to know on to Mark and came up with this book called Matthew. And so they would say that this timeline had to be written after Mark. In this scheme, Mark had to be written after 85 AD because that was the final split between the synagogue and the church. Now, that's just an arbitrary number, but that's what they've come up with. And so in this scheme, Matthew was written in response to the conflict between Rome and the Jews, the destruction of the temple of 70 AD. So for them, it had to be written after 70 AD, after 85 AD, which would have put it into almost the second century, which would mean that Matthew probably didn't write it. That, that's why all of that other stuff that I told you. That's the normal timeline that you're going to get in, a, in an institution of higher learning that, that doesn't believe the Bible. Let me say it this way. Doesn't believe the Bible is God's Word. All right? And so that's where they will push it. By the way, do you, anybody want to guess why it has to be after the destruction of the temple? Because Jesus... Or let me say it differently from this perspective. Matthew put words in Jesus' mouth that promised the destruction of the temple. That not one, well, nobody can do that unless they, they can tell the future. And since nobody can tell the future, it had to be after that that they wrote it. This should sound familiar because that's what they do to the prophecy of Daniel. Remember, Daniel makes some startling prophecies. They said, well, obviously nobody can know the future, so he had to write it after it happened. That's the same thing they do with the book of Matthew. You know what I believe and what the Bible attests, that Jesus did make prophecies about the, the fall of the temple, and they actually came true because of who Jesus was. But I just, I just show you this because that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a completely divergent approach to Scripture. So when you see the National Geographics talking about the Bible, don't believe them. National Geographic is not the place to get your, in, your information about the Bible. They are wrong. <laughs> in fact, to say it like I like to say it, they are wrongity wrong wrong. All right? They are just way wrong. You can't trust a non-believer to talk about where the Scripture came from because they have some prejudices. What they would say is that I have some prejudices, and I do. I believe Jesus is, is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Everything else after that flows from that. So I do. I have that. I believe that there is a God. Yes, absolutely. But their prejudice is the opposite. There is no God, there can't be a God, and he can't send his son to die for the sins of the world. Well, you're going to get two completely different perspectives on the Bible based on those two things. And so, and by the way, for those of you who, who think I'm being super rigid in my approach to this, it's because I am. You to quote Jesus, <laughs> to quote Jesus, you can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve two masters. And so what happened in the 1900s, 1800s, 1900s, are that Christians tried to have it both ways. In fact, the, the old joke is, 
uh, the Christian says to the, to the, to the non-Christian scholarship, if, uh, if you call me a scholar, I'll call you a Christian. The, because the, the world views, they, they would view me, hopefully, they would view me the way that they viewed the disciples of old. They're just unlearned, unlearned hicks. Yes, sir. Yes, I am very close-minded. I am very close-minded. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's right. Everybody, everybody approaches everything with certain primary thoughts, and those primary thoughts determine the rest. Now, what I believe is, is that God's Word shapes those primary thoughts. So as I go to God's Word with primary thoughts, God's Word then unpacks those and changes my primary thoughts in order, because God's Word is the revelation of God. So he, he does that, but nothing else does that. Nothing else does that. And you will see more of that. I don't want to get bogged down here. I said I had a bite-sized lesson today, but <laughs> it's not. So that's the general timeline according to modern scholarship. Many traditional scholars, um, by the way, when you see me use the word traditional, that means like I would consider myself a traditional scholar. I hold, I hold the same things about Scripture that all the Christians from all of history have held about, about Scripture, right? We've all believed the same thing. I, I think that if you, if you and me and John the Baptist get together, we're not going to view things very differently, right? So, that's, so when I say traditional scholars, well, many traditional scholars believe it was written pre-70 A.D. I do. The last recorded events in Acts are about 62 A.D., all right, so when, when we find Paul getting ready to set sail for Spain, that's about 62 A.D., which, by the way, is only about 30 years after Jesus ascended and was seated at the right hand of the Father. So we're only talking about 30 years span. And in fact, I believe, let me see how I'm going to say this, with the exception of the Revelation, which is still up in the air in my mind, I believe that all of Scripture was written in that span. I believe that by about 65 AD, we have everything we're going to have. You say, why do you say that? Because I believe something as significant as the burning of the temple and the sack of Jerusalem would have been recorded in Scripture if it would have happened after 70 AD. That's just my own. Now, the real question is revelation, but we'll get there next year sometime. <laughs> we'll get there. So, uh, the last recorded events in Acts were around 62 A.D. Nero's persecution of the Christians is dated to 64 or 65 A.D. It was certainly in Nero's persecution of the Christians that Paul and Peter were killed. Peter is the source for Mark's gospel. So when Mark said... Um, I should have this quoted. I've got it, but I've been reading other things. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger ahead of you. When Mark wrote those things down, I picture him seated across from Peter and Peter saying, now the beginning of the gospel goes like this. All right. And Mark is writing it down. That's the way I view it. it may not have happened that way, but certainly Peter is the apostolic source for Mark's gospel. And, and Peter and Paul were dead in 65 AD. So I believe that all of this was written prior to 70 AD for sure, and probably prior to 65 AD. So I would date Matthew around 65, 64, 65 AD. And I'm not, the, I'm not a genius. I'm just telling you what I read and what I believe. Um, about this. There are guys, there are other people who, who read. So we're, but we're talking about really, and, and the gospels, these, these four canonical gospels are probably the last books of the New Testament written with the exception of possibly Revelation. So these are the last books written and we're talking about 64, 65. Paul's writing his earliest stuff is, is probably 50, 51, 52, possibly the whole New Testament written in about 15 years. 
from, from 50, let's say 50 to 65, just for round numbers, with the possible exception of Revelation. I'll just give it away. Lots of people believe that Revelation was written in the 90s because John lived to be sold. John was the youngest of all the, all the disciples. He lived the longest, um, and so they would, they would see him writing in the 90s. I, I could be persuaded pre-70. There, there are two, two persecution eras that it could be written in, the persecution of Nero in 64, 65, the persecution of Domitian, uh, in the 90s. And so it was, it's tied to one of those. I can be persuaded either way, but not now. So the purpose, the purpose for writing, um, he wrote for several reasons. By the way, there are no stated purpose. We will see some Bible books in the New Testament that have a stated purpose. Uh, First, first John chapter 5, verse 13, these things have been written to you that you may know you have eternal life. John chapter 20, he says, these things have been written that you may believe in the name of Jesus the Christ and believing may have life in his name. All right, so John clearly spells it out. Matthew doesn't. Matthew doesn't spell it out. But in reading it, we can see that he, there are several purposes that are just right out there. The first is that Jesus is the promised Messiah. You see that from the very beginning, the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. All right, from the very beginning, that Jesus is the promised Messiah. Remember, he's writing to a Jewish community, at least partially Jewish community. And so he's saying to these Jews, listen, we found him, or rather he found us. He, he came. He walked onto the scene. So Jesus is the promised Messiah with all that it means, everything that, everything that the Messiah means, the coming kingdom, all that stuff. It's all together. Jesus brings it all. Number two, he also seems to want, one of his purposes is to show that many of the Jewish leaders sinfully failed to follow him, which means you can date it anywhere you'd like. I've heard some people date it at 70 AD. I've heard some people date it at 33 AD when Jesus rose again from the dead, Wh whatever. Sometime in that span of time, Judaism became a false religion. Now, hear what, I, hear what I'm saying, and I'm trying to be really careful. I know this is going to go out on the internet. Maybe I'll get this part taken off because this is this is one of those things. But what, what's saying is that if you are a believer in the one true God, as demonstrated in the Old Testament, you will recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And those who stuck to the old teachings without the Messiah, without Jesus, are leading now in, a, in an incorrect path. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? Uh, now, let me say it in a little less bombastic way, because I know, I know how that just sounded, but I believe it. Jesus himself said it this way, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And if you don't believe in me, you wouldn't believe in the Father who sent me. Simeon, one of my favorite one-liner characters in all the Bible, saw Jesus as a baby and knew it. So here's what, here's what I am asserting. I am asserting that one of the reasons that Matthew wrote what he wrote, the way that he wrote it, because obviously the book of Matthew is different than the book of Mark. It's different than the book of Luke. It's different than the book of John. They, they, it comes from a different perspective. One of his purposes is to show that the leaders in Judaism were misleading the people when they led them away from Jesus. Does that make sense? Is that fair? Do you understand? It's right. It's right. I just, I, 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 the way I said it initially was just bang, but it's true. Let me say it a different way, and with this, I'll finish this statement. 
There is no other name given among men whereby you must be saved. There's no other way to the Father except through him. Jesus is the way. You say, can Jews be saved? Yes, if they put their faith in Jesus. Can Muslims be saved? Yes, if they put their faith in Jesus. You see what I'm saying? Can, can Southern Baptists who are lost on their way to hell, can they be saved? Yes, if they put their faith in Jesus. That's the call. That's the only hope. All right. Man, that sounded crazy. But it's true. And, and by the way, this is where we, lead, we go. In a, uh, we... Baptists stirred up a stink a, a, a decade ago or so when we, when we made one of our focal points winning Jews to Jesus. Because the world says, leave them alone. What they believe is their own truth. But it's not compassionate if we leave them in their own truth. It's compassionate if we point them to the Messiah, who, by the way, is Jewish. <laughs> Jesus is Jewish. Point them to the Messiah and say... Here's your Messiah. Put your faith in Christ. So, many Jewish leaders sinfully failed to recognize him. The third, the promised kingdom had already dawned when, with Jesus' presence. We'll talk about the kingdom in just a second, if I get there. Number four, that his reign, his kingdom, continues in the world today. All authority has given, been given to me. Go ye, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you. The King is with you, the one who has given you all authority to do this. And lo, I am with you always, even until the ends of the age. That's Matthew's writing, by the way. Matthew wrote that. His, his reign, his kingdom continues in the world. Verse number, or verse number five. Number five, this kingdom not only fulfills Old Testament hopes, but also is a foretaste of the consummated kingdom when Jesus returns. So we live today in a period that's called already and not yet. The kingdom is already here in its fullness. It is not yet here in its consummation, in its completion. We live in a time of already, not yet. We are becoming, it is becoming, I don't even know how to say it. It is becoming the kingdom of God and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. Okay, yeah, okay that, there it is. Everybody good with that? Are y'all liking this? Is this good? Okay, good. <laughs> Let's look at the distinctiveness of Matthew. I've got about... 25 minutes, and I need to scoot. So here, first, the first distinctiveness. By the way, this distinctive characteristics, these are distinct compared to the other Gospels. What sets Matthew apart? That's what this distinctiveness is. His Jewishness. Matthew seeks to show that Christianity is the true continuation of the Old Testament faith. That's what I just talked to you about a little bit. Jesus is the natural, or you could say supernatural, conclusion to the Old Testament. The promise of Malachi comes true in John the Baptist and Jesus. That's what we have. There's a, there's a, there's a continuation here. We know this, we see this, because he does not find it necessary to explain Jewish terms. The other writers did. Uh, on occasion, not always, but they did. So the other, the other writers say, well, this is, this is what this feast meant. This is what this activity meant. This is what this thing meant. Matthew doesn't do it. He just names it and keeps going. He, he presumed their understanding. He begins his genealogy of Jesus with Abraham. I've already talked to you about that. And he quotes the Old Testament more than twice the next closest gospel does. So he quotes a lot of Old Testament. Why does he do that? He's showing the natural continuation from the Old Testament to the New. He is using the Old Testament to support his truth. 
By the way, this may also be, Miss Vicki, why it's the one that was uh, the earliest, or the, uh, not the earliest, the, 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 the primary gospel of the early church is because it was the natural conclusion from the Old Testament and the New. They had the Old Testament in its entirety. They didn't have the New Testament in its entirety yet. And so he quotes a lot. It, it, it showed the tie. In fact, I need to reiterate to you what I told you all through the Old Testament. The Old Testament scriptures were the Bible of the early church. It's what they had. So we need, it's, it does no harm to preach Jesus from the Old Testament. That's the way it's meant to be preached. So, so his Jewishness. Any questions about that? Y'all have seen that, right, in the book of Matthew? You recognize that he's writing to it? Maybe you've heard a pastor talk about that before. It's, it's clear. It's one of the most distinct um, qualities of Matthew's work. The second is the fulfillment in Christianity. This goes hand in hand with, uh, with his Jewishness, uh, but he shows that Jesus is the fulfillment of the promises. He wrote often that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. He repeats that. That's a Matthew formula. Nobody else uses that like Matthew does that it might be fulfilled that which was, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. He presented the truth that all of Israel's experience had been fulfilled in Jesus. That's the presentation. That's what he's showing you, that, that everything, every promise in, in, of the Old Testament is yes and amen in Jesus. By the way, that was Paul saying it, but still, it's the truth. He mentions Jesus as Messiah 17 times. Now, I have quotes around that because your copy of Scripture will say Christ as Christ, but, uh, but it's, it's only the difference in language. The Greek uses Christ. Hebrew is Messiah. He mentions Jesus as Messiah 17 times. He highlighted the fact that the blessing of God searched for by the Jews has been passed along to the followers of Jesus. I want to show you this. This is true of both Jew and Gentile. All right. What I want you to see mainly, the way I want you to think about Christianity is that all of the promises from really from the promise that God made to Adam and Eve in the third chapter of, of uh, Genesis, all the way through Abraham, through David, all the way through the Old Testament, are fulfilled, wrapped up, if you will, in the person of Jesus. So in, in a way, he is the final statement of everything that's gone before. No, and nothing comes after Christ. This, this is a way to think about it. This is just, to help, I hope this is helpful for you. So Jesus is the final person in the lineage of promises. And so every promise that God has made to you or to me is only accessible in the person of Christ. It's why I believe that Paul wrote in Christ so many times. So you and I only have access, and by the way, the truth is the Jews too, only have access to the promises of the Old Testament in Christ. Christ is the natural recipient of all the promises. He alone kept all the covenants. He alone never sinned. He alone is the son of David. All those things. He's this, one, this person. And so when you and I put our faith in Jesus, we are now in him. So the, 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 um, the biggest picture of our salvation is union with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ in me. It's this union with Christ that allows us all of the other promises in the Scriptures. The same is true for a Jewish person. A Jewish person. The only way that a Jewish person has access to all the promises of the Old Testament is to put their faith in Jesus. Well, guess what? If a Jew... If a Jewish person is in Jesus, and if you and I are in Jesus, guess what that means? 
that the dividing line, the dividing wall, the wall of separation between Jew and Gentile has been torn down and that we are one in Christ. And that's the picture of the whole New Testament, of, of the whole Christian experience of our unity. It's in Christ. Does this make sense? Yeah, black, uh, yeah, no division in any way. That's why, um, that's why Paul says, he doesn't just say Jew and Gentile. He says Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female. So it's, it's all uh, in Christ. All of those distinctions are null and void. We are one person in Christ. Does that make sense? All right. So, so that's the, this is the, he highlighted the fact that the blessing of God, searched for by the Jews, has been passed along. Now, by the way, the reason why I make this so clear is because you'll often hear people talk bad about folks who, who say that, there's, that the church is the people of God and say, call them replacement theologians, that somehow they said that the church replaces uh, Israel. I'm not suggesting that in its in, in, its, the way, in its starkness that way. What I'm suggesting is all of us are one people. There's only one people of God. Who are those people? Those who are in Christ. So Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, black or white, you know, English speaking or not, whatever. We're all one people in Christ. That's the only way to be relate, in relationship to God is in Christ. Now, I know what that looks like from without. It looks like that I just cut off the Jews and I said it's only the Christians. But I'm telling you that the natural flow of Christianity is Christ. I mean, of, of, of Jewishness, of Israel, is Christ. He's the seed of Abraham, capital S. He's the promised one of Abraham, capital P. It's him. So we'll get farther into that. But Matthew agrees with me, or I agree with Matthew. Third, ecclesiastical agreement. We're going we're to go kind of quickly here. Um, Matthew is the only gospel to use the word church. Ecclesia is the only gospel to use it. Matthew demonstrates an interest in building the church. Remember, it's in Matthew that Jesus says, upon this rock, that is the confession that he is the Christ, on this rock I will build my church. One of the two places. Um, the other places, Matthew, that's Matthew 16. Matthew 18 is the other place he uses the word church. And that's when he says, Jesus is talking about if you have, uh, if you have a problem with your brother, uh, go to him. And if he won't hear you, take another with you. And if, uh, if, if he still won't hear you, take him before the ecclesia, the church. By the way, the word ecclesia is used in the Old Testament Greek translation we call the Septuagint. Um, it's used there to speak of the congregation of Israel. So the idea of congregation is read back into the Old Testament in the Greek language using the same word, the called out ones, um, ecclesia. So Matthew demonstrates this interest. This, Miss Vicki, I hate to keep using your name, but you asked the question. This is another reason why it's, it's, the, it's the primary gospel, the one at the beginning, is because he mentions the church, and so the church uses this early as their as their instruction guide. Um, again, we'll see that <laughs> maybe next week, but in a few minutes. This gospel became the primary reading of the early churches. That's what I just, that's what I've been alluding to the whole time. Became the primary reading of the early churches. It was their instruction manual, the book of Matthew. Did y'all get, did y'all get that? Did I, is it on your handout? No, I, you have to write it down. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody good? All right, two more. Anti-Phariseeism. He shows there that this is, these are the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day. He shows their inability to see God's hand at work through Jesus. He, I mean, he hammers it so much so. This is why, by the way, this is why there's such a disunity over over who he was writing to. Because at one, on the one side, he looks like he's writing to a company of Jews. He, everything about this is the Jewishness of this gospel. But on the other hand, he is so hard on the, on the Pharisees in the way that he, he, he writes, the, the, the things that he says about them. 
And so he shows their inability to see God's hand at work through Jesus, and he accuses them of intentionally attempting, attempting to defeat the work of God. In fact, it's in Matthew that we have the unpardonable sin, attributing, uh, attributing to Satan the work of God. And so, and, you know, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is what that is. And so it's here, and, and Matthew clearly says it's the Pharisees who are doing it. And so we just have this anti-Pharisaism. Uh, also, the Gentiles, Matthew is intrigued by the attention the Gentiles give to Jesus. Uh, it's in Matthew's gospel that we have so many of the records of, these, uh, of the, uh, the Syrophoenician woman coming to Jesus. The, you know, all these, the Canaanite, well, the, the, just all these folks coming to, uh, coming to Christ, and he knows it, the, um, the Gadarene demoniac, you know, just all of this uh, that, that he shows. Matthew's intrigued by that. He's the one that recorded the, the account of the Magi, foreigners, acknowledged Galilee of the Gentiles, lauded the centurion's faith, the centurion who was a Roman, centurion's faith, and the daughter of the Canaanite woman. All of these he includes, plus the four women in Jesus' lineage who are non-Jews as well. He, he's just intrigued by it. He, he writes a lot about, about uh, Gentiles. And, it, and so you get this kind of a, a weird sensation when you're reading uh, Matthew. It's like, well, he's speaking to Jews, but he's really, he's really happy about the Gentiles. And so it, it's just this dichotomy that goes throughout the book. Does that make sense? All right. And then Jesus' teachings. It is obvious that he valued teachings. We have in the book of Matthew more extended discourses, teachings of Jesus than anywhere else in the Bible. It's Matthew's gospel that record these teachings. He alone recorded the extended Sermon on the Mount. We have the Sermon on the Plain that Luke records, but it's much more abbreviated. Uh, if you remember, the Sermon on the Mount is three chapters long. And it's just constant teaching. Uh, he organized the book. We'll see this in just a moment when I look at the outline. But he organized the book around five sets of teachings. They are, they are the literary structure of the book of Matthew, the five discourses. So it's clear that he valued teaching. Now let me go back to why it was the primary gospel in the early church. Because of its teachings because of its recorded teachings of Jesus. Remember, I said this last week, ultimately Christianity is not a list of doctrines. It's a following of a person. And it's in the book of Matthew that we have the teachings of, these, of this person. Do you know what a disciple is? A follower of Jesus. It's a learner. It's a learner. And so the way they were disciples... Jesus said, hey, follow me. But he didn't just walk away and they follow him and he just kept walking. He taught as he walked. He walked as he talked. He, they went together and he would see something and he would explain it. They're, st they're standing around a, uh, the temple and this lady comes up and he throws it, she throws in two little copper pieces. And you can imagine, everybody's like, oh, poor lady, that's all she had to give. And Jesus teaches. He uses it as a teaching moment. What does he tell them? She gave, she gave more than everybody else you saw because she gave everything. That's Jesus' teaching. We have those teachings preserved for us in the book of Matthew. So this is teaching. So the early church used this to show its new converts and old converts it's new converts, what it meant to follow Jesus. These are Jesus' teachings. That's why, ultimately, uh, Vicki and others who had that same question, that's why it's the, the one in the beginning. Matthews has all of that. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Carolyn. They were teaching parables. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the parables are recorded in the book of Matthew, too. Uh, we'll get more to that, maybe, well, yeah, here, in the kingdom. I got 10 minutes and I got to cook. So, um, on your handout, I put two, uh, two discourses <laughs> about, uh, about his teaching on the kingdom, because it's Matthew's view of the kingdom that really sets him apart. It's because of his tying the Jewish kingdom, the kingdom of, of God, 
that stretches all the way back to, uh, uh, for sure, to David, but even before that, this kingdom that extends until Jesus returns and sets it up here on the earth. All right, so we are in a kingdom age, and Matthew shows it to us. He uses kingdom, uh, he uses it in three different ways. He calls it the kingdom of heaven, he calls it the kingdom of God, and he just calls it the kingdom, preaching of the kingdom. And so he uses it, and he uses them a great number of times. He introduces 10 parables with the kingdom of heaven is like. Does anybody remember? This is a quiz, this is a pop quiz from Sunday morning. So you had to be here Sunday morning. What were two of the parables that I mentioned? I mentioned three. What were two of the parables that I mentioned Sunday morning? The parable of the mustard seed. Yeah. So the parable of the the treasure that was in the field, that was the last one I used. There was one more. The parable of the leaven. The parable of the leaven. All three of those are parables of the kingdom. The parable of the leaven. You know, the kingdom of the kingdom of heaven is like a woman who who was kneading a, a piece of dough and put in a little leaven, and at the end the whole thing was leavened. Well, that's an intentional parable about the kingdom. I don't have a lot of time to go into the kingdom. We'll get into it a little bit later. Well, I'm already in the kingdom, praise Jesus. But I get into it in this discussion. I don't have time to get into it today. We will get into it later. But I do want you to understand that this, this picture of the leaven in the, in the lump of, of dough is the, is the definition of the kingdom. It's right now, even right now, the kingdom is spreading like that like that yeast through the lump. There's coming a day when Jesus is going to return and put his feet on the earth, and the kingdom will come in its fullness. But what we'll see is that all the way along, the kingdom was spreading, just like that yeast through the... Through. And by the way, that's not the only parable that Jesus tells to demonstrate that. The mystery of the kingdom, I think this is in one of your writings, the mystery of the kingdom is that it didn't come like they thought it was going to come. How did the Jews think the kingdom was going to come? Yeah, politically, uh, military, that kind of thing. And it didn't. It came spiritually. And even now, people are looking for this, this you know, the kingdom. To, and, but I'm telling you, the mystery of the kingdom is that it's here already, and it's spreading right now like wildfire one person to another with the, with the proclamation of the gospel, and then soon it will be consummated here on the earth when Jesus returns. Does that make sense? Are we good? All right. We'll, we'll do a little bit more of that later. Uh, but that's it. He, his, he references the kingdom in both present and future tense. It's here now, but it will come. And so we have to, as, as teachers of Scripture, we have to incorporate that concept. It's here now. But it will come later. We have to, you have to incorporate both of those. So that leads us to the outline. There are lots of ways to outline it. There are some people who outline this, all three synoptics, Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, in the same way. Galilean ministry, well, a prologue, Galilean ministry, movement to Jerusalem, Jerusalem ministry, death, burial, and resurrection, and then epilogue. That, that's the way that all those can be done. But that really robs each of the Gospels from its own unique place. When they wrote, when the writers wrote, they, they organized a theme with it. And so that's the way we're going to do it with Matthew. Here's the outline. The prologue introducing Jesus, chapters 1 and 2. Uh, that'll be all the, the birth narratives, his genealogy. Number two, the gospel of the kingdom that begins with, in fact, I want to read just one verse from chapter 3, 3, 1. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so the gospel of the kingdom, uh, starting in chapter 3 and going to the end of the, of the uh, Sermon on the Mount, 729. Number three, the authority of Jesus and expansion of the kingdom, chapters 8 through 11. I didn't say this, but starting, starting with number two and going through number six, so numbers two, three, four, five, six, all end with um, 
teaching, those discourses. Remember I said there were five discourses? That's the outline here, those five discourses. Number four, opposing the gospel of the kingdom, chapter 11 to chapter 13. It's in, chapter, uh, it's in those chapters that Jesus really spells out what the kingdom, um, what the kingdom is like. Number five, understanding and misunderstanding the kingdom. There are those who are understanding it now. Peter is one of them. Notice that chapter 16, his great confession, is right in the middle of these, of these chapters, chapters 13 and 19. But also misunderstanding the kingdom. <coughs> Hold on. Sorry, I just got dry all of a sudden. Uh, it's that pollen. Understanding and misunderstanding the kingdom, and uh, those who are misunderstanding it are those who are really now plotting against him to kill him. Number six, opposition and eschatology. This ends with his discourse on Mount Olives, Mount of Olives, the Olivet Discourse, um, where he's talking about the future. Uh, but we still see opposition. That's in Jerusalem, all of it. And then finally, I didn't know what else to call it, cementing the kingdom. That's his death, burial, resurrection, and great commission. All of those put together there at the end of the book. So that's the outline that I am using. I've taken that from other people, different, but the wording is almost all mine, but, but I, took the, I took the breaks from other people. The, the, yeah, the, so the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and the Great Commission. Because remember, Jesus inaugurated the, the kingdom. The kingdom came when the king came. He finishes, he consummates the kingdom at his second coming when he comes back. Those are the markers, beginning and ending. We are living in the kingdom age. We are expanding the kingdom based on his great commission, what he told us to go and do. This is, we live in the age of the king, in the age of the kingdom right now, and it's spreading right now. Does that make sense? That may be different than you've heard it growing up or whatever. I'm different. Um, I, I, I come from a little bit of a different perspective, but uh, um, by the way, it's, I, I believe... It, what I'm calling the age of the kingdom today is what I called the day of the Lord back when we started the, the prophets. I believe it started at some point, his, death, his preaching ministry or his death, burial, and resurrection, at some point the day of the Lord began, and it will end when he comes back. And that accounts for um, the day of Pentecost fulfilling Joel's, Joel's prophecy of the day of the Lord. So... I believe, I believe we're living in that age, the kingdom age. Everybody good? All right. Any questions? Is this what you signed up for? Was this good? All right. We'll do more Matthew next week. We're not done with Matthew. I just, that's the introduction. Yes, ma'am. Um, it depends on when you're asking that question in like, in like 70, uh, let's say 60, let's say he wrote it in 65, there would have been one. By 70, there may have been five to 10. These are guesses. I'm, these are not, I'm just guessing. By, by 150, let's say 100 years later, there are probably 100 copies. Uh, we, have, we have the patristic, the, the, the church fathers quoting him constantly. But remember, these, these folks didn't, didn't, initially learned by reading, they initially learned by memorizing. And so if you count those as copies, I mean, people had memorized it early on. And so you had lots and lots and lots of people knowing any, anybody might, if they could write, they could have sat down and written it down because they knew it in their, in their heads. No, no, we don't. Probably the same way. They, uh, you could just, uh, with this I'll finish. What she asked was, do we know the process? So imagine this. Somebody has been sent from Ephesus to go to Laodicea with 
what we know as the book of Ephesians, what they would have known as the letter we just got from Paul, right? So let's say they go, and I'm just making this up. This is just completely made up. So they've got this, this letter from Ephesus. He walks into Laodicea and he goes, hey, I just got news from Paul. I want to I wanna read this to you. And he stands up and he reads this letter that they've got, which is probably just a copy because Ephesus kept the original. So he's got the copy and he just read it to the church at Laodicea. And they're like, hey, that's pretty great. We just got this thing from Mark and we want to read it to you. And they read it and they're like, oh, wait, can I get a copy of that? And I'll take it back to Ephesus. That's probably how they probably traded it. Maybe not that exact, but, you know, they, they probably traded them and they just, they just spread. And if it wouldn't spread like that, it went from this guy walks up, he doesn't have anything in his hands, and he goes, hey, let me tell you what I just heard. The beginning, yeah, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You know, and he, and he just begin to talk, and they're listening, and they're memorizing it as they go, and so it gets there that way, too. So that's, that's probably the way it went word of mouth. It went hand to hand. It just spread. It just spread. And by the way, that's what skeptics have a hard time grabbing, is that it spread accurately. And yet we believe that the same God who inspired the word protected the word, preserved. The, the right theological word is preserved it. He preserved the word along. Yes, ma'am, Miss Polly. Yes, yeah. Uh, they, they learned, whatever they learned, they learned by memorization mostly. Um, I mean, there were people who could read and write, but not everybody could. And the materials to read and write were expensive. Um, if you were going to write on cow's hide, it cost you a cow. <laughs> so they probably had like good memories. Yeah, they had. Uh, we do have good memories. Ours are not exercised. Ours are not exercised. Theirs were exercised, and they were, yes, they were much better. Because they, they had to. They had to remember. They couldn't, if they couldn't write, the only way to get it is to me- remind it. Um, Sue's dad, uh, this could be said about many, of, many dads in here, many moms in here. I just know this one because I know Sue. But Sue's dad was a cabinet maker, a, a carpenter by trade, and uh, he didn't write measurements down. He, t- he took measurements, but he didn't write them down. He memorized them. He remembered them. Isn't that true? That's, that's, he just remembered them. And that was true about lots of people. Um, we had a little Vietnamese lady, I need to finish, a little Vietnamese lady named Hen who ha- had came over, if you remember the Vietnamese boat lift that came over into California in the, in the 70s, Hen was one of those ladies who came over. She was a, a young teenager then, but she came over from Vietnam to California. She made her way to the, the, the great metropolis of Mississippi, and, uh, and that's where she was. Uh, she was. She was there in, in Mississippi, and she was a seamstress. That's what she did. She, w- she did our, our curtains in our new house in Memphis. And so she came over, and Myra said, all right, I want this done, and I want this done. We had 20-foot ceilings in, the, in our house in this one room, and, and so you can imagine the size of these draperies that were made for those windows that she wanted. I want that, and I want the ones in the, in the uh, breakfast nook to, to match. I want it all to match. So she walks in. She looks at it. She tells, she tells Myra, she says, go buy 18 yards of cloth. And so Myra went and bought 18 yards of cloth, and there was scraps of one yard left over. It's just, it's a gift, but their, their minds are exercised that way. I hear you keep saying smart people. We could do that too if we exercised our minds that way. We could do that. It's, they're not any smarter than us. They're just exercised in different ways. And so, yeah, that's the way it, that's the way it passed, word to word, mouth to mouth, all over. In fact, in the, in the New Testament, there's a place, I can't recall it right away, which says that the, that the gospel was gossiped through the, through the countryside. It was just, just like, hey, guess what I heard? Hey, guess what I heard? And it, went, it, just, it just went on went through. So yeah, very good. God bless y'all. Thanks for sticking five extra minutes.